Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. It's supposed to be a response. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I'm Keith Brooks from the Education Department, but here as a part of uh, faculty development. Uh, welcome to Prime Time at the BU Library. Uh, Prime Time at the BU Library's mission is to encourage lifelong learning beyond the classroom for faculty, students, and staff through its presentations, which are a collaboration of many different offices on campus with the Friends of the BU Library. Uh, looking ahead on this Thursday, we will have uh, uh, we will welcome a Faculty Excellence Award winner uh, for service, uh, Dr. Robin Haslam, who's also from the Education Department. Uh, but today, we welcome Stina Busman, Hannah Bartell, and Adam James as they share their teaching and learning experiences in Cambodia. Can we welcome them? Thank you, um, and thanks for coming. In January of 2010 and January of 2011, I had the privilege and opportunity to take two groups of Bethel students with me to Cambodia. And I taught a course there entitled Christian Social Justice, Theory and Praxis. And as I was thinking about what I was going to share today, so many different things came to mind. And I think Hannah and Adam and I could talk up here for hours at you um, and with you about the experiences of contemplating justice in that environment. So I'm going to give you a snapshot of some of the things that I could talk about that I'm not going to talk about. And then I want to go ahead and talk about one of the most surprising things that I think affected the teaching environment in Cambodia. So we're thinking about justice in this course. And certainly, I think we could talk about the emotional and psychological impact that the content of this course has had on us. So if you think about a typical street scene in Cambodia, this is a street scene in Phnom Penh. It's one thing to lecture about human trafficking. It's another thing to walk down the street and know that in particular hotels there are young girls that are being trafficked. It's a very different experience. It's one thing to lecture and think about genocide, but it's another thing to actually walk on human bones, which is what happens when you go to the killing fields in Cambodia. So we have these emotionally, psychological realities that are affecting experientially the teaching, the learning, and the content itself. It's one thing to think about victims of sexual trafficking, right? Um, you know, we can talk about the fact that there are very young girls who are trafficked daily in Phnom Penh. But it's, it's another thing to actually encounter these girls. So one of the things we do on this trip is we hang out with girls who are victims of sex trafficking. This would be one example. We get to play hopscotch, we get to play volleyball with girls who months earlier were locked in a brothel um, and forced to service men daily. Uh, so this is what we encounter in this course, and I could spend hours talking to you and with you about that, but I'm not going to do that this morning. Another thing that we could talk about, which I have found particularly interesting from a teaching perspective, is the crazy things that come out of your mouth when you're chatting with students in an off-campus context. I've said things to students that I never thought I would say. Uh, for example, I have told students, please don't taunt water buffalo. Water buffalo are not friendly. I've had that conversation with students. You never think you're going to talk about water buffalo um, in a class on justice. I've also told students that under no circumstance can they purchase and bring home USSR issued machine guns. Not an option. Is it a possibility in Cambodia? It is actually a possibility. So you have these conversations, and I was actually going to think about a top 10 list of things that I never thought would come out of my mouth that come out of my mouth in this environment. I'm not going to talk about that though. You know, another thing that was impactful in the course is, is constructing it narratively. And, and Holly Andrews, who team taught the course with me in the past two years, we were really intentional about engaging narratively in, in, in a narrative format this course. And so we began our course here. We began our course walking um, through the phenomenal buildings of the Khmer Empire. We talk about the fact that the Khmer em Empire gave rise um, to colonialism in many ways. We talk about the impact of colonialism. We talk about how colonialism was the breeding ground for 
powers like the Khmer Rouge. We talk about how powers like the Khmer Rouge and the genocide end up leading to contemporary injustices like trafficking today. So if you're interested in thinking about how you teach in a narrative format, I'd love to think about why that's significant, especially when we're dealing with the questions of justice. Another thing that students reflected on in Cambodia that I thought we could talk about um, was the fact that this is our typical scene um, in January. Well, this might be your typical scene <laughs> in Minnesota. So there's a pretty big contrast here from um, picture A to picture B, but we won't talk about that either. Instead, I want to reflect for a few minutes on this picture. If you've been in Cambodia, you know what this is, right? What is this? Sixth floor of Goldiana. Sixth floor of the Goldiana. Um, that might not mean anything to you if you've not been in Cambodia. This is our classroom. So I want to spend a few minutes today talking about the significance of the physicality of the learning environment. And then if we want to talk about some of those other images and those other realities, we can go ahead and do that. So the physicality of the learning environment, I think, is something that we don't often contemplate in a collegiate setting. If we think about a traditional classroom context, like this, for example, the collegiate environment, specifically the collegiate classroom, is one of the most scripted, right? We can think about the fact that there are desks that are in a classroom, and these desks are designed so that students can be in a seated position taking notes. There is typically one table in the room that's elevated. There's perhaps a lectern that's also elevated. There are specific focal points in a classroom to which you should direct your attention if you want the information. And, you know, I'm not here to necessarily debate classroom furniture, um, although we perhaps could get into a pretty heated debate about why our classrooms exist in the way that they do. But what I want to do is I want to talk for a few minutes about the benefits of an off-campus course and ways that they stretch our perspectives on the physicality of the classroom. There's a text by Henry Nouwen called Creative Ministry. In this text, he spends time actually talking about the physicality of a traditional collegiate classroom. And here he's talking about theological education. And he talks about the fact that this can be pretty restrictive in nature. And he, in fact, would identify this um, and some of the things that come along with it as being violent. Um, that there is a violent process of learning and then there's a redemptive process of learning. And we as Christians, and especially as theological educators, are supposed to adopt this redemptive approach to learning. And so we contrast what is a unilateral understanding of power and knowledge and what is a bilateral understanding of power and knowledge. And he would contend that in a unilateral understanding of power and knowledge, this particular format is normative. One individual has a power, one individual has a knowledge. Other individuals that enter this classroom know their role. You walk into this classroom and you know if you're not the teacher, where should you sit? You should sit in a desk, right? Uh, and, and I think that, you know, there are instances when this particular environment might be the best space for learning. But I think one of the great things, and this almost happened by accident, the great things about the teaching environment and learning environment in Cambodia is that we never, not once, sat in a classroom. Oftentimes it was too expensive to actually rent out a classroom or it wasn't available. And so in, um, in Nouwen's work, he talks about the fact that it's really important for both students and teachers to draw out the best in each other in a learning environment. And so we need to think of creative ways to co-create that environment. That not, it's not simply the teacher's responsibility to bring the power, to bring the knowledge, and to use that. Rather, it's everyone's responsibility. So if we think about this environment, um, this massive veranda, one of the most significant things for me about this context in Cambodia was that every day we had to physically construct the classroom together. So every day we had to bring chairs. Sometimes there would be a construction project and so we'd have to move our classroom. But I think what was really important <coughs> is that everyone participated. Everyone was a creator 
of this environment. And I think that that brought out something um, in each other. It was the case that you always had to ask the question, whether you're a student or whether you're a teacher, what is gonna be most conducive for learning? Is it a circle? Is it an oblong? Are we gonna have to find a set of stairs to sit on? And how do we construct ourselves in such a way that we are all learning together? And I don't think that we often get to ask that classroom. We don't get to be co-creators together, and there's not necessarily shared responsibility in creating a learning environment. And the truth is, in Cambodia, there were times when our classroom environment failed. And I can think about an example, which I'm sure that a lot of you can remember. We were sitting um, under a gazebo. And this gazebo was kind of carved out of the jungle. And we had one particularly feisty three-legged monkey, believe it or not, um, that was ready to attack us. And so I put my teaching assistant on monkey duty, which meant that she was supposed to hold a stick and wave it at the monkey so that we wouldn't be attacked by this certain monkey. And I think that there's video of us um, online somewhere, probably on Facebook, um, in which we are attempting to have a class um, in which it just simply wasn't conducive. But I think what was important is that we all recognize that it failed. And I think sometimes when we think about failure in the classroom, we often put the onus on the teacher, right? Teacher failed. I think students sometimes assume that they come to observe, to watch, but they aren't participators and they don't have a stake in the failure or the success of the learning environment. But in that particular situation, we all had to get up, we all had to move, and we all had to reconstruct the learning environment. And I think that there was something significant for us about a situation like that, where daily we had to rewrite that script of the learning environment. And, you know, as I come back to Bethel, and I always notice this when I come back in the, in the spring, the classroom feels pretty restrictive to me. The fact that I have to get up and I have to stand at a lectern and then I have to talk to students and, and in some ways I can't recreate and I can't give responsibility to the students in the way that I would like to because of some of the restrictions that we have, of course, it's right in terms of the syllabus, in terms of what's expected. And I think students can come into the classroom and they can assume, you know what, I can sit there and I can be on Facebook and I can do whatever I want and the teacher is the one that's supposed to teach me. And so, one of the tasks and one of the responsibilities that I've taken on myself is how do I think about my environment here at Bethel, my teaching environment, differently in light of my experience teaching in Cambodia. And I want to mention one other thing about that before I introduce two students who are going to come and share with you about what it means to learn in the Cambodian environment. And that one thing that I want to add concerns the importance of absolutely every single student. I teach a lot of sections of Christian theology here, they're large, and often I can't expect every student to be in class every day. But when I'm in Cambodia, I expect every student to be at class every day. Not because I want perfect attendance, but because their presence really matters. And their absence maybe matters even more. If someone is absent, are they wandering? Have they gotten lost? Are they sick? Those questions always are asked. And so if you think about a class that you might have here, and you think about, do the students really matter in the classroom? Can the class survive if one student is missing? And I think often it can. Um, and I'm not suggesting we radically transform um, our classes so that we have to cancel class if one student is missing. That's probably uh, not the best approach. But I do think we could place more significance on each student when we're thinking about the class environment. So um, I, I know that it was a, a benefit for me when I was there to have every single student present. So I would love to be in dialogue with you about some of my experiences in Cambodia, but before we do that, I want to turn it over to Adam and Hannah, and I'm going to have them reflect on learning in the Cambodian environment, and then um, at the end we'll kind of maybe share some collective thoughts on the, the combination of teaching and learning in the Cambodian environment. Hello. Hello. Um, so like Stina said, we could talk we could talk about a variety of different things for hours with each and every one of you. And some things, for example, are like like the elephant ride that some of us had in the center of Phnom Penh, or like the tuk-tuks and how crazy and scary those rides around the city are when the roads are so busy. Or like the beaches and how beautiful they are. Um, we could talk about any of those things for hours with you, but 
um, in planning this, we figured those are things that you could go on Google and learn, <laughs> or those are things you could go to the study abroad office and learn about. Um, but our personal experiences are things that you can't find in other places. Um, so that's kind of what we want to share with you today. And mainly focusing on, um, on why, why we went on the trip, um, what is like one or two experiences we had that were shaping while we were there, um, and what now? Like, trying to answer that question. Like, we went on this trip, we had this learning, but what now? Um, and can you hear me okay? Okay. Um, I kind of wanted to just go over a simulation that Stina and Holly did towards the end of our trip that I think will help kind of explain why I went on this trip. Um, I'm going to call it the rack simulation <laughs> or very large boulder. Um, we, our class, when we were in Scenicville, we looked at this huge rock. It's just massive. And, you know, Stina and Holly are telling us to have a conversation about this rock, and apparently this rock is going to teach us something. Um, and so um, we were forced to have dialogue with one another and, you know, talk about, ask questions about this rock. What is it? Where did it come from? Why is it shaped the way it is? Um, and, and then our professors took us onto the other side of the rock and asked us again to talk about it, dialogue about it. What does it look like now? Why do you think this, this, and that? And um, I saw how that was directly um, related to my trip in Cambodia and justice in particular. Um, I'm in the United States, in Minnesota, um, seeing justice from, I'm learning about it in a social work perspective, from a social work perspective, and seeing it from a certain position. Um, a very, you know, white woman, American way. And um, I think just going on this trip allowed me to see um, the boulder, the injustice, justice, the issue from a different perspective. I don't think more questions that I have got answered. I think I got more. I have more questions now. I don't necessarily have any answers, but I'm asking more questions. And I was forced to have dialogue um, and, and with, with everyone on the trip. And that was that's essential, I think, when we're talking about injustice and justice and what God's um, plan for that is and his, um, his faithfulness to the promises that he's saying about justice. And so, um, anyway, that's, that's kind of why I went and um, I, yes, so that was the environment of Cambodia for me was stepping into a completely different perspective that I would, you know, that I'll ever have maybe, or that I was used to. Um, a couple of experiences that stand out to me, it's really hard to, of course, choose, um, but I think a point of the trip that um, really impacted me a lot was going to um, a beach that, what, Stina, what was it called, do you know? Pachetil? Where, uh, where you go and sit, you sit, on the, you sit on the sand and they bring your food out to you and the restaurants are kind of lined up in back there. Um, and please feel free to correct me if I'm wrong. But um, mo <laughs> what you see there is um, a lot of different um, young women, young Cambodian women, and you see a lot of tourists there as well, like ourselves, we're considered tourists. And um, you know, in particular, one couple stood out to me that, uh, you know, an older, an older man, white male, with a younger Cambodian woman. And um, I personally didn't experience this myself, but going back into the restaurants, um, there are rooms of mattresses and, um, you know, girls laying on those mattresses, and um, that, is, that is their life. And we, you know, I mean, making eye contact with one of those girls and, and just, you feel like you're seeing, you're seeing so much and seeing so little at the same time. You don't know their story. You don't know everything that they've been through. You can't possibly understand what it is that their life has experienced, that they have seen, that they have felt, that they have um, been through. And at the same time, you just see their girl like me. And why is it that I'm in my spot 
in you know, at Bethel in the United States, and that um, a Cam Cambodian girl um, serving this this man, and up to 15 plus men a day, maybe more, you know. And so, um, I would say that was a very significant moment for me. Um, walking away from that beach is is one of the hardest things I felt like I've ever had to do, because. Um, you know, Stina, maybe you don't feel comfortable with this, but sometimes I think um, any of us students wanted to just snatch those little girls and run. We don't know what we would have done. Taking them back to the hotel was not something we could do. You know, what were we going to do after, after we grabbed those little girls and ran, you know? But it honestly, being in situations like that make you want to act on impulse and you re really don't know what to expect from yourself. Um, and so it is really hard to walk away from that and um, not bring those girls with you. Um, and so I think for me that made me think, okay, you step out of, outside of that experience and think, so I can't grab these girls and run, what do I do? Um, what am I supposed to do? You know, why is it that there, why is there this demand for these girls? Why do the um, brothel owners why are they in the position that they're in in the first place? Are they to blame, really? I mean, why is it that they don't have enough to survive on and that they own these brothels? Um, you start to ask just so many questions. And I think um, where I'm at now is you, you realize just the ultimate despair that you can feel sometimes about suffering, human suffering, and injustice. Um, but then reflecting on the trip, um, I have really realize I need to hold on to hope and to God's faithfulness because um, the promises that we learned about in this course that God has for um, us and for those girls, for the men and women in Cambodia that have witnessed um, incredible suffering and oppression, um, he will be faithful in the end. And we know that we're entering into a marathon that he is the victor in the end. Um, so I think it's learning a lot about how to run the marathon um, of tackling injustice and um, um, understanding God's heart for justice and then um, what each of us, what our place is in that. Because you don't have to be a social work major, you don't have to be going to Cambodia. You have influence as any major, as any human being, in your business major, in your accounting major, in um, nursing, everywhere you have influence. and. Human trafficking that we learned about, um, that this trip was largely focused on, we know that it is a complicated issue and that it is um, very involved. There are so many systems influencing it. So um, everywhere, I guess I feel like we have influence and um, yeah, I think I've shared that. So Can I hop in and say one thing about that experiential exercise? Yes. Yep. Um, We'll do a little tag team here. So Hannah mentioned um, this rock that I had students look at. And it was toward the end of the class. And so I think that they trusted us a little bit that we weren't doing something completely ridiculous. Um, but if you could imagine for a moment this massive boulder. This boulder kind of has this smooth surface. And um, you know, you can notice some features. Perhaps uh, there are some dips in it. There might be leaves that are on it. And you can kind of, if we think about, and I'll, I'll kind of walk you through this uh, experience, uh, injustice is like that rock. We get really used to seeing it one way. And what I had students do is, okay, so I had them kind of stand at the top of the hill and look down at this boulder. And then I had them walk around to the other side of the boulder. And the boulder looks quite different on the other side. In fact, there are little um, spaces carved out of this rock where people have incense burning, they have um, built little houses for different gods. It looks completely different from the other side. So you see a new face, a different face of injustice. And then what I had students do is I had them go back to that first position, right? So they're standing and they're looking at that rock again from that first position. But the truth is you can't ever see the rock in the same way again. And so you come back from an experience like Cambodia and you can't ever see injustice in the same way because you know what's on the other side. And as Hannah was speaking about those questions of what is next, what is our responsibility, you learn that we all, we get comfortable seeing injustice in one way and we kind of stop seeing it. And so the challenge in a course like this, right, is that 
we get to see it from another side. And that changes who we are in this context, in this environment as well. And so I think there's some difficulty then in processing that when we come back, when we've experienced it differently. And all of a sudden we have to encounter and have conversations with people who haven't had that same experience. So I just wanted to elaborate a bit on, on what I think was a really important experiential exercise for us in the class. <coughs> and now I'll hand it over to Adam. <coughs> Um, I think, let's see, I think in reflecting on the trip, like, for me, the biggest theme and the biggest thing I had to remember was this difference between um, the marathon and the sprint. And the reason I signed up for the trip, the reason I wanted to go was because I was like, okay, I've learned new things about sex trafficking and I've learned that Minneapolis is the biggest hub in the country for sex trafficking. Um, so if I go to Cambodia, I'll learn new knowledge, I'll learn how God deals with this stuff, and then I can tackle it all and we can eliminate sex trafficking, and it'll be great. And <laughs> so like that's kind of the mindset I had, and just uh, imagining this happening. And um, we, went, we went on the trip and we started doing our learning and reading and everything, and um, I remember one thing Stina said in her presentation was, fairly quickly on the trip, you realize like there's a big difference to what I'm reading about and what I'm learning about and what I'm seeing on the streets and the hotels I'm passing. And we went to um, a cool like cultural show one night but across the street was a karaoke bar that's actually a brothel. And just realizing that like you're sitting at this theater watching a show while there's a brothel across the street. And all of these things start to sink in during the trip. Um, and for me, I was still just trying to analyze and process and take in all of the information. Um, but the day that it started to shift for me mentally, um, was when we visited one of these aftercare homes. Um, we had signed up to go visit and play volleyball and do all these things with these women. And um, in my mind, I was like, oh, okay, it's gonna, like, it's gonna be like summer camp. Like, they'll all be excited to see us because they're gonna have visitors. Like, we can go play, have fun, all of this stuff. Um, and we showed up and that was a day of joy and excitement and everything for most people on our trip. But for me, that was one of the hardest days. And, because we walked in, and there weren't, there weren't a lot of women in this place. There were mainly girls. And uh, some young teenagers, uh, but mainly, like, what I saw was little girls. Girls the size of my nieces and nephews. And just realizing that they had been through this experience already. Um, and that in the brothels that they were in, they were actually valued uh, the, at the highest price um, because the younger ones are more expensive. Um, and that was just a hard day for me to reflect back on and be like, okay, it's starting to make sense to me, like, like what, what is wrong with humanity? Like, what's wrong with us? How, how do we process this? And then we got to that beach that Hannah was talking about. Um, and I remember one night when we were on that beach, uh, sitting down and just enjoying uh, fellowship with our friends on the trip and enjoying each other and enjoying great food because it's really cheap on that beach. And unfortunately, that's what kept us going back to the beach. And I remember one night sitting there um, and a teenage girl came up to me and she started like rubbing my shoulder and talking to me and trying to sell herself to me. And um, that experience, like her face will never leave my mind. Um, because in that moment, like Hannah said, in that moment you want to just be like, okay, like come with me, I'm gonna run you back to the hotel, we're gonna go to Stina's room, we're gonna go to Stina. We have to leave now. <laughs> I don't know what we can do, but we have to leave now. <laughs> um, but instead, like you can't, you can't do that. 
and instead you have to say no and you have to send her away and um, you know in the back of your head that it's probably five minutes until someone says yes um, and you know that you're leaving that beach walking away from these things and letting them continue and that's when the idea of marathon versus sprint um, really hit my mind and when the idea of okay I can't fix this right now um, but there are things like there are great organizations in um, Cambodia working to fix these things and we can contact them and we can get them aware of this beach and these places and then they can start moving and it's a process but it can be done and God's powerful and things won't happen in an instant but they will get done um, and this marathon will be won by God as Hannah was saying um, and I think the takeaway for me from the trip is reflecting on these things and reflecting on the moments where these things hit home and it became real and then coming back here and I remember my first time going to Vespers coming back here and we sing that song where we keep repeating your blood is enough to break every chain and last semester I'd go to Vespers and I'd sing that song and I'd be like yeah like break the chains in my life like set me free yeah go God um, but, but then you come, I came back from this trip and we started singing that song and I just sat down and I was like, I was like, really? Like, if it's enough to break every chain, like, let that girl I ran into free and let these other girls and young women free and, um, move in these other countries and move in these great ways and this trip really um, really taught me more how to think in more of a kingdom aspect and less of a self-centered aspect and um, and just realizing that yes we we need to be working as a body of Christ but um, we also be, need to be realizing who our family of God is and that all of us our children of God, um, no matter what religion we proclaim or don't proclaim, or what things we do or don't do. Um, what separates us is the location we are born or some choices we made. Um, the systems we entered into, the systems we were privileged by, the systems that we were stomped on by. Um, we're separated by like little things here or there, but we're all human. And I remember one question a guy on the trip asked when when sitting on that beach and watching a Khmer man and a tourist, I don't know where he's from, but um, exchanging money and sending the tourist off with a girl, um, the guy on the trip said, Adam, like, what makes us different from him? Like, where, where in our lives did we get separated from him? Or why should we assume that we're any better? Um, and just this idea of, of not only like wanting to end, <laughs> end injustices and everything, but this idea of realizing that we're equal with those causing the injustices. Um, and that our hearts should break and our hearts should break just as much for them as well. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. What now for me just includes uh, definitely a shift in my theology, um, which if you're worried about, like, oh, it's biblical justice, like, I shouldn't go on the trip, I'm a BTS, I'm not a BTS major. I was the only BTS major on the trip. So don't worry about that. Um, <laughs> but, and even I, like, I got humbled a lot in my theologies and my paradigms and thoughts and everything. Um, so what now for me is a shift in my theologies, a shift in the way that I worship and the way that I pray, and also um, just trying to spread awareness and um, just continually praying that God will keep moving 
in Cambodia because there are some great organizations there. And then there's some organizations there that I'm going to hopefully someday try to replicate in um, the church communities that I end up in. Um, but yeah, I don't know. Right. Yeah. yeah. Do you have any closing? No. Uh, um, I think we've got a few minutes for questions. So if anyone has questions, um, five minutes for questions. Oh, we've got five minutes for questions. Um, anyone have any questions yeah. for, yeah. Is Cambodia like the Philippines and Thailand where there are also young boys involved in sex trafficking? Yeah. You just talked about um, the girls. Yep. Uh, they're, uh, they're definitely, um, are our young boys that are trafficked not to um, yeah the same extent uh, and there have been a couple of organizations that they have that have homes um, for boys who have been trafficked and World Vision in fact um, about four years ago did a, an extensive study in Cambodia on the trafficking of boys and looked at specific communities um, there certainly are different ethnic groups and the Vietnamese for example are more exploited in Cambodia and Vietnamese boys in particular yeah. I, I love like the idea of location and sort of the the engaged or experiential learning maybe it's yeah. it, but how do you separate between I mean that's the most powerful place maybe to experience and learn and know but how do you separate that that leveraging of the place with objectifying the place uh, or or um, m becoming observers of how, how does how does the relationship ha, how, how do you see that that tension is there a tension between <coughs> being amongst people in poverty or in oppression and engaging with people in poverty and oppression and how do you as an instructor or teacher how do you sure that? I mean I think that that's that's a constant tension mm -hmm. uh, and I think that um, I mean the very fact that we have the ability to, to go there, right, to pay thousands of dollars um, to be in that situation, I think puts us in a predicament. And, um, you know, we had one student on the trip who always said, you know what, we, we're failing before we even get to begin. Uh, that a relationship is doomed from the start when I encounter a street child. Um, and uh, that relationship has already been scripted in, in pretty radical ways. And so um, I, I think one of the challenges that we had to face was that that can't move us to apathy or resignation, but rather that idea of, um, you know, this might be, uh, you know, let's say, I don't, um, people do marathons differently, but let's say this is mile six, and mile six is a lot faster and it's a lot more intense than the other 20 point something. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think recognizing that it's a portion of the journey, and I would say that intentional reflection about the experiences is paramount. Mm -hmm. um, if you're just having the experiences, um, I think that you could sometimes um, do more damage than good. And I, a, a book that we use on the trip was the book When Helping Hurts, which I think is a very readable approach to some of those complex questions where you're, you're, you're trying, right? You've got good intentions, but those good intentions can sometimes create massive damage. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I think resting in that and then intentional reflection, cultivating cultural intelligence and recognizing that, you know, even, and, and I told my students this, I'm on the journey uh, and I fail, you know, we had one particular situation in which, um, you know, uh, I think that both Holly and I could have handled differently, but you're constantly thrown into these situations that we processed with our students. We said, you know what, we're definitely not perfect here. And so um, we're learning uh, alongside you. Um, and we want to accompany you on this journey. So those are maybe some, um, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, for me, as a student, like, I remember signing up to go, like, I was like, okay, I want to destroy injustices. That's why I want to go. Um, but then getting there and reading When Helping Hurts, or the first three chapters, um, and recognizing my own God, God complex in that thought and in the thought of, okay, like it's my job to fix this or it's whatever. Um, recognizing that change changed our and changed my mindset um, as to how I wanted to help with this and how I wanted to be involved. And I remember one big task I kept trying to accomplish was, um, we didn't talk much about the genocide, but 
Um, I really wanted to find like theology books <laughs> written from Khmer Christians who had experienced the genocide because I know that their theology of justice and their theology of evil and pain are going to be much more beautiful than mine. So just recognize, like for me, I just recognized through the trip that it's so much more that I have a lot to learn from the community as well. Um, so I think that was definitely picked up by a lot of us on the trip. Um, and that definitely destroyed the uh, objectifying nature of it. Mm -hmm. Hey, are there any other questions, comments? Well, let's give them a hand, please.